In this uh, lecture today, we will uh, uh, discuss uh, the imaging, uh, using radiation for imaging. And it will be essentially divided in two parts. One longer part will be about uh, ionizing radiation imaging, let's say X-ray imaging. Then we will have the final part on non-ionizing non radiation imaging, and we will touch on uh, magnetic resonance imaging and uh, uh, ultrasound. So uh, this is a picture I like, you know, it's an, it's an example of uh, how everything started you see, in 1895 with this uh, uh, very famous picture of uh, uh, Dr. Röntgen's uh, wife, uh, hand, uh, and where are we now? You see, again, we have a hand, uh, but you see the difference now, how uh, in this century, more than a century now of progress, uh, uh, how big was the progress? I mean, how how <laughs> how much better we can now visualize? You see here, uh, this is a tomography of the hand, uh, and it, it's a combined imaging procedure where you can nicely see the bones, but you also see the the the, the muscles, and you see the 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 vessels going into the into the hand. So it's a it's a looks like you know an order of magnitude improvement but uh, you see still there is a lot of radiography that you do uh, cheap radiography simple radiography that you do that is not so different from the image that uh, Röntgen published uh, uh, more than a century ago so uh, the definition of medical imaging is that this is a, a non-invasive visualization of internal organs and tissues the image is typically a 2D signal or a 3D signal. These days, more commonly a 3D signal. Uh, of course, it's used to identify any kind of pathological conditions, but you need to recognize clearly the normal anatomy if you want to see any, any disease. Uh, the the, the um, steps, let's say, to get the, the medical images are, are the following. You start with the, an energy source, which is uh, uh, incident X-rays or injective radioactive materials. We will see that you can have uh, imaging using an external source, or you can have imaging exploiting an internal source. Uh, actually, the, the discussion of the internal source imaging, uh, we will do it in the nuclear medicine, uh, in the nuclear medicine uh, lecture, because traditionally the uh, external beam imaging uh, goes into the imaging topic, uh, but the, the imaging that you do using radioisotopes goes into nuclear medicine. Because nuclear medicine is, is the branch of medicine that studies uh, medical application of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, different radioisotopes. So, of course, the energy source uh, uh, will have interaction, you know very well the physics of the interaction of ionizing radiation. Uh, and, and this, uh, in combination with the tissue properties uh, and the detection system, of course, you need the, uh, the, the, the uh, specific uh, detectors that we will discuss for imaging will give you what is called the medical image. So um, the, the, the steps are also, are also identified here. You have the object, which is an anatomic object, can be a, a head, for example, a full uh, skull, because you want to make, for example, an MRI of the brain. You have an imaging device here. This is a CT uh, scan. You have the data. The data actually looks uh, not so easy to read when you get, you, we will see that the path from the uh, crude imaging data to the imaging, uh, to the final image is very complicated. Unlike uh, what is with the radiography, where you essentially you put the film, you irradiate the film and you see the image. When you have 3D reconstruction, uh, the, the, the data look like that uh, and the final image looks like that. Uh, there is one thing, before we go into any kind of 3D imaging, I want to point out that it's important to know what are the anatomical planes. Uh, there are the, the, the following the three uh, anatomical planes. Uh, uh, one is the coronal plane, which is the, also clearly is the frontal plane, but in medical imaging is called the coronal 
plane. Uh, the opposite of the coronal plane is the uh, is the longitudinal plane, of course, is not the frontal, but it's longitudinal, and it's called sagittal. So coronal is the frontal plane, and sagittal is the longitudinal plane. And sagittal can also be median plane, is, is a sagittal plane that goes through the exactly in the middle, and parasagittal planes are those instead that are shifted compared to, to the median plane. In addition, there is also the axial plane, which is a, 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 a horizontal transverse plane. So uh, this is important to keep in mind because we will see a lot of images and generally at every imaging you always have coronal, axial or sagittal uh, um, label, and then you know now, looking at this picture, I think you understand immediately what does it mean. So, the major modalities are summarized here. Uh, we will spend a lot of time on the traditional plain X-ray method, but then we will touch on CT scan, mammography, angiography, fluoroscopy. All of these techniques are uh, ionizing radiation X-ray imaging. Uh, using, uh, in all these cases, external sources. Uh, you see either an X-ray source or a rotating X-ray source. Uh, mammography is also an X-ray source, uh, so is angiography and fluoroscopy. Then we will touch on, uh, on uh, uh, um, non-ionizing radiation, like MRI, uh, which is magnetic resonance, actually exploits uh, uh, radio frequency waves uh, in combination with the magnetic field. Ultrasound, which is, of course, is not even uh, electromagnetic radiation, is, uh, um, is uh, um, sound, so it's, uh, it's longitudinal waves. And then next time, when we will touch on nuclear medicine, we will see SPECT and PET, that are two imaging procedures exploiting incorporated radioisotopes, not in this lecture. So, X-ray imaging, the, the so-called film radiography, is still extremely popular. Uh, tradition is done with films. So you actually expose film and still is done many times with that. You have to hold the cassette with the film inside. Uh, the direct exposure film has a relatively low absorption coefficient, uh, uh, epsilon, for photons in the diagnostic range. <clears throat> but it is still used in many combinations of image, re uh, image receptor systems, so you still have films. Uh, they have a special design of two photographic emulsions with protective layers between, uh, uh, in between to optimize the absorption coefficient of the photons. Uh, correct exposure is important to produce a reliable image on the field. Over on underexposure will result in loss of contrast and therefore possibly in loss of diagnostic information. So for the films, the correct exposure is very critical. We will see that when we go to digital imaging, which is now taking over, let's say there are not many films left, even though it's still used sometimes. When you go into uh, digital imaging, the problem of the exposure is less uh, relevant. But the physics uh, remains the same. So I think it's important to, to, uh, to go a little bit into the physics of the imaging, starting from the uh, X-ray films, because it will be pretty much the same when we move to the more sophisticated uh, uh, techniques. So the most important quantity, of course, is the blackening of the film after X-ray exposure. Uh, and this is given by the optical density. The optical density is the logarithm in, 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 uh, in 10 base of I0 divided by I, where I0 is the incident uh, intensity and I is the, is the transmitted intensity uh, of, the, of the light here, of course, because this, this is an optical density. Of course, you all know that uh, these uh, films, uh, just like a photographic film, even though these days nobody uses photographic film, and based on the silver bromine grains, uh, if you have G silver bromine grains per unit area, the average cross section of the grain is B. And after radiation with the flux N X ray photons per unit area, a total number of G small grains per area are sensitized. So this means that essentially the, the, the silver bromine in the presence of the energy is divided in silver and bromine, and it is the silver, actually, the, the metal silver that gives the uh, high density area of, of, of the field. 
the number of sensitized grains per incoming uh, uh, X-ray photon is given by, by, uh, by this formula. Uh, K here is only, is only a, a, a conversion constant and X is the dose. Is the is the is the X-ray is the X-ray dose in G, uh, G capital G as I said is uh, uh, the silver bromine grains per unit area. So of course, if you increase uh, the number of silver bromine grains, uh, you will get a higher a higher number of um, of sensitized grains. And of course, if you increase the dose, eventually these terms goes to zero. So you have that the number of sensitized grain per unit area is the same as the number of, uh, of the um, uh, silver bromine grains. Uh, the sensitized grains then develop into a silver spec with an average cross section A after the, 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 film, the, the film development. If light hits one of the silver specks in the developed film, it is completely absorbed. That gives you a, a, a black a black spot. So essentially, you see this: uh, the area of the body where uh, where the X-ray film is actually absorbed will be light, and the area of the body where the X-ray film is not absorbed, uh, where the X-ray photon is not absorbed, will be uh, that will be sorry. The area where it is absorbed will be light, and the area where it's not absorbed will be dark. So that's why you always see. Uh, I think in the next slide you have the typical image of the bone, you know, which is white against the the the, the back the black background in the in the in the film. So uh, with this formula, you can relate the, the, the number of grains to, to, the, to the intensity. And then if you, if you use this relationship to calculate the optical density and you, and you correct for the factors, uh, you see that the optical density can be calculated in, in, the, in, uh, in, in this way, 0 0.434. G, which is the, the activated grains, and sigma is the cross-section of the, of, the, of the grains. This relationship is very important. It's known as nothing's law. And the maximal, maximum optical density for an area on the film is, of course, obtained when G is equal to G. And this gives you the maximum optical density of a, of a film. Uh, the maximum optical density is here. And generally speaking, the, 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 the the, the characteristic curve of, of the film is given by, by this kind of uh, sigmoid curve. Uh, this is the formula, of course. And uh, um, this, the center part of the curve between, uh, in this center part of the curve, the relationship between optical density and those, or the logarithm of the those, is approximately linear. That's the area where the, the, the film is not saturated and the photons are not too low, uh, the, 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 the intensity is not too low that you don't really impress the film. So you end up with a formula like this, so that D is gamma logarithmic 10 base of uh, uh, X divided by X zero, this is delta D. Uh, this constant gamma is known as the gamma of the of the film is called the gamma of the film and ranges somewhere in between two and three uh, and it really gives you the slope of the linear section of the of the characteristic curve of the film uh, a film with an optical density below 0 0.5 is very light and a film with optical density greater than two is very black so the, to achieve the best contrast the, the film has to be exposed in such a way that the region of interest in the patient cause feed doses, which are in the center of the characteristic curve. So you see that decide the exposure time for films is not so easy. Depends very much on what you want to see in the, in the film. So as I said, the, the characteristic, uh, the, 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 the films are not used uh, very little used now in the in the clinical practice. It's preferring to go into the digital uh, X-ray imaging, which is based, of course, on voxels, let's say, pixels or, or or voxels in 3D imaging and pixels in uh, in 2D imaging. Uh, 
um, the value, let's say, of the, of the pixel is given de depending on the X-ray intensity. Uh, and then you can give a shade of gray to each pixel getting then a, 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 a to the image. So why, if films are so good and so old, why we bother with digital? There are several reasons that you can see here. Essentially, of course, uh, everything which is done in digital now is much, much easier and faster to visualize. I mean, you don't need to develop a film, you know, to put the film, to look at the optical densities, everything is, uh, is uh, is automatic uh, and you see on the on the screen of your computer you immediately see the the, the image uh, the problem is the dynamic range though you see with a conventional film if you have a low dose uh, you will have what is called a thin film so this kind of image and if you have a very high dose you you have a very dark film and you can hardly see anything you see so uh, the, the dynamic range of the conventional film uh, is, uh, is quite limited and you have to match it if you want, if you want to see something. Uh, this, the advantage of this in the conventional film is that it gives you a, a control of the dose over the patient. This is almost lost uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, digital imaging because you see, if you have a, a dose which is too low, you still have a good image, except that it starts to be very noisy. And if you increase the dose, you have a very good image and it is less and less noisy. So uh, you have to be careful here. Uh, you have less retakes. You don't need to repeat the imaging because it's always good. But you have what is called the dose creep. So you have to be sure, you have to make sure that you don't just increase the dose exposing the patient to an unnecessary high dose in digital imaging radiography. So the, 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 in digital radiography, you direct acquire the data in, in digital format, no separate readout phase like with, the, uh, with CR, with, the, with conventional radiography. So it improves the throughput of the X-ray system is the most expensive uh, method as it requires a complete dedicated x-ray system but it's relatively relatively cheap these days uh, the main technology main important technology are the phosphor coupled to a re readout device uh, is the indirect conversion or the so-called ASCE tft array which gives direct conversion flat panel so you can have either indirect conversion or direct conversion for indirect conversion, uh, this involves converting the X-rays into visible light, into a phosphor, uh, and detecting the resulting light photons. So for doing this, you can use uh, amorphous silicon, photodiode thin film transistor, TFT. TFT means uh, um, um, thin film transistors. So it's a thin film of transistor. Uh, or the, the CCD camera, of course, for, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for readout. Uh, the sharpness is limited by both pixel pitch of readout array and spread of light in phosphor. Usually is the, this the cesium iodide, which is used. Uh, these, are, these are needle phosphors to focus light down to the detector, like mini fiber uptakes to, to, to minimize spreads. Now, this is, uh, this is how effectively it works. You see, you have an amorphous silicon uh, uh, flat panel detector. Here you have uh, uh, X-ray photon. This is the phosphor that converts the energy of the photon into light. And then you have a photodiode array. So you have a conversion here, and here you connect the light at the point. It's not anymore, it's not anymore uh, photons. And then you, how can you see it? You can see it with the, uh, CCD detectors, you see either this way you have uh, uh, phosphor, X-ray photon, fiber optics, for example, to the CCD, <coughs> or you can use lenses, which gives you also the possibility to zoom on the image uh, um, using a, CCD, a lens uh, on the CCD. 
When you have instead of direct conversion flat panel, the situation you don't really convert into light. You use amorphous selenium. That's the the the, the current technique is using amorphous selenium, which is a photoconductor, and this converts X rays into electrons. So it's a semiconductor. It's like a it's like a detector, like a solid state de de detector. So you convert into electrons, and this deposit directly into amorphous silicon TFT, this uh, this, this um, uh, thin film transistor array. You don't need the uh, phosphor, and the resol resolution is governed by the effective pitch uh, 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 pixel pitch. So you see it here, you see this is the X-ray photon, there is an insulator, this is the uh, amorphous selenium, and here you have the, the, the collection electrode and the, the uh, TFT array. Um, so the physics, as I told you already, you know, it's, uh, um, you, you convert it in, you are, I think also familiar, is similar to the detectors. The charger is read out by TFT array, and then images simultaneously produced on the uh, on the on the computer screen depending on the intensity so you see gray level depends on the charge from each sensor and the uh, uh, lookup table window level settings uh, the tft array is important you see is actually used both in indirect uh, um, uh, uh, imaging devices and in di in the in direct uh, uh, imaging devices. Uh, these are transistors that amplify electric signal. The electrical signal is stored in the TFT array until released by applying a high potential. Each row of detectors is connected to the same activating potential is a gate line control. And each column to a charge measuring device, readout electronics. So the activating potential is applied row by row. So the timing of the detected signal determines the position of the pixel from which it is originated. So you kind of read it, you know, going row by row, you, you read the different pixel. Each pixel is generally approximately 100, 100 microns. So this is the resolution of the digital imaging. This, this is how they look like, you see, in the, uh, this is the uh, amorphous uh, uh, silicon sensor matrix, so this is the, the phosphor readout electronics is here, and gate line control is here. So essentially you use the gate, -like, the gate line control to activate the, the potential and the readout electronics to read the, 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 the corresponding potential from the different uh, uh, vex, uh, voxels. All of this on a glass uh, uh, substrate. This is how they look like. Maybe many of you know it already because if you take a radiography these days, you generally hold uh, a flat panel or you have a flat panel on the back uh, mounted on the back of you. Uh, what about now? Okay, so this is, let's say, the, the, the typical, typical techniques that you use, for example, for uh, bone radiography or if you want to have a lung, uh, uh, a lung radiography, which are typical applications that you do commonly. You know, if you have problems with the lung, you want to have a lung radiography. Uh, if you have any kind of bone uh, um, pain, fracture problems, first thing you do is a is a, a X ray X ray imaging. But you can go a little bit higher now in uh, uh, resolution and also in uh, uh, in capability. One example is mammography. Mammography is now becoming is now becoming one of the uh, main tools in prevention of breast cancer in women and you have seen in our previous lecture how uh, grave is the problem of breast cancer uh, this plot is interesting because you see this is the incidence per 100,000 women in us as a function of the year um, for uh, uh, all invasive breast cancers and metastatic breast cancer so that for metastatic breast cancers, there seems to be no difference. But if you look at invasive breast cancer, you have a jump here corresponding to the introduction of mammography. Uh, this jump is a jump of approximately 30% up. So there is now 30% more uh, tumors that can be diagnosed with mammography that could be diagnosed in the past using uh, 
uh, ultrasound or using conventional um, X-ray techniques. So now it's an essential technique because you can actually have early detection of breast cancer. When you have early detection of breast cancer, like T1 breast cancer, then you can remove it uh, with, in this very little invasive and prognosis is extremely positive. So mortality is almost zero when you get the T1 uh, breast cancer. So uh, early diagnostics here is very important. The problem you see here is that you have to squeeze the, 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 the breast because you have to make it as thin as possible. In fact, the, the, uh, it used low energy X-rays uh, from shell resonance, typically somewhere in between 17 and 22 keV. And uh, uh, the spatial resolution is, uh, is excellent, is 0.1 millimeter per pixel, and can detect the minimal tumors, uh, but with many false positives. You see it here. I mean, here is pretty clear, but if it is very small, you see in principle, you can see many apparent tumors in this fibrosis uh, uh, tissue of the breast. So um, it is very important, of course, to get the best, uh, uh, the lowest dose, because breast is also sensitive for cancer induction, and the best contrast in mammography. Uh, you see here the formula that gives you the the, the the contrast here as a function of the SPR of the so-called scatter to primary ratio. And this is interesting concerning the, the, the false positive and false negative. This is a very recent paper, 2020 actually. So it's, a, it's a, I have to say last year because now we are in 2021. So it's a, it's a paper of last year where Google is actually, uh, uh, Google has a, a artificial intelligence system and use this artificial intelligence system for uh, breast cancer screening. And they found out that they can, uh, that their artificial intelligence system has a better sensitivity and specificity uh, than uh, the medical doctor in, 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 in detecting uh, uh, breast cancer in mammography, even though some type of breast cancers like this one here in the bottom were detected by radiologists only. So uh, the other, uh, another important innovation in X-ray imaging is using dual energy imaging. That's essentially a subtraction technique uh, where images are taken at high and low kilovolt in rapid succession. Uh, subtracting the low kilovolt image from high energy kilovolt minimizes visibility of the bone and improves uh, uh, soft tissue constant. So this is uh, uh, this removes the ribs in chest radiography essentially. Conversely, if you do the opposite, uh, high kilovolt, if you subtract high kilovolt from low kilovolt image, this will give you the bony anatomy in much greater detail. That's because, of course, low kilovolt uh, has a high contrast between bone and soft tissue. And while in high kilovolt, uh, the image is determined by tissue density rather than atomic number because you use Compton effect, you don't use photoelectric effect. So it's the, the different physics of the two. That's how you do it. Essentially, you can do it, uh, you can do it very quickly using flat panel detectors. You see, you have the uh, 60 kilovolt image, uh, and then uh, you make a uh, 120 kilovolt image after readout of the low energy image. Uh, and that's essentially how, how, um, how it, uh, uh, it, looks, it looks like. You see, this is a, a kilovolt uh, uh, image where you have a strong uh, uh, image of the bone uh, using photoelectric effect. You see, this is the 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 weight if you want the, the 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 eight is the bone and three is the tissue while this is when you go to um uh high energy imaging uh, uh, this difference is much reduced now if you do the difference you see if you if you have to do a weighted subtraction by scaling you see in this case you take the high minus the low using uh, good scaling of the uh, of the uh, of the images in a way here you see that uh, 
the bone residual goes to zero. You have four times two minus eight times one goes to zero. And uh, soft, while, but you still have a soft tissue residual. So you see that now magically from this chest image, you don't see the, the ribs anymore. You don't see the bones anymore, which is, I think is very strange. I mean, but this is very easy to do now. You just change the energy of the X-ray machine. Uh, the other way around, now if you do low minus high, again uh, with the, uh, the right weights uh, to get completely rid of the soft tissue, now this one goes to zero, you have a very nice image of the bones without any disturbance from the image of the soft tissue. Fluoroscopy is a real-time X-ray imaging technique. It uses flat panel detectors and contrast medium like barium, iodine, and, and or, or different metals. Uh, the main problem of fluoroscopy is the total dose uh, to the patient that can be very high because these films uh, are relatively long. So fluoroscopy is generally used for films, for visualizing live the movement of uh, uh, contrast medium in the body. Uh, using these flat panel detectors. But there are many other applications, for example, in surgery, you know, in uh, when you use catheter ablation for, uh, for, uh, um, for ventricular tachycardia, for example, you need the image of the heart all the time. And then again, you use fluoroscopy. I give you here a couple of examples that I think will clarify. This is a nice example. This is a... Uh, um, uh, a story that I took from a recent paper we, we can see here. JAMA, JAMA, the JAMA Network. The JAMA Network, JAMA is the journal, of, JAMA Pediatrics, uh, Journal of American Medical Association, is the, is the video fluoroscopic swallowing study. So this is a baby that went to the hospital with the strange symptoms in the abdomen. And they did this uh, uh, video, video fluoroscopic uh, swallowing study that demonstrates, if you look carefully, a perforation in the proximal oropharynx esophagus. Uh, because we, you will see that the constant filling uh, um, uh, is filling a false lumen posterior to, to the esophagus. So during the imaging study, the barium is noted to extend along the lower cervical and upper thoracic le level with a distinct entry and exit point. I will show you, I will show you here now. I think it's very, it's very impressive. So here you see the, the baby is wallowing and this should go through the esophagus. So it's wallowing the, 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 the barium contrast medium. But here you see clearly that instead of going straight down, you have the a false lumen here. There is a distinct entry point here, and you see a second, a second uh, line that extend uh, along uh, the, 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 the cervical and upper and upper thorax level. So you see, this is the right one that should go through the esophagus and this is the other one. So the diagnosis here is that this uh, choking uh, that looked like choking, but is a perforation of the esophagus. So this baby has, uh, has perforation of the esophagus. It's a quite, uh, uh, quite uh, amazing movie, I think, showing this. Uh, in this other movie here, you see, you will have, instead of having this, uh, uh, this sagittal view, this, this was a sagittal view, this is a barium esophagrom in anterior-posterior view. This is the AP view, you see, this is the anterior, and now you see very nicely, the barium should move continuously, of course, downward in the esophagus. But there is a brief moment of peristalsis, you see, it's a reverse flow. So the, now the barium completes its journey into the stomach completely. But you have seen this moment of peristalsis where it goes up, you know, this reflux where, where the barium was going up. So I think this is uh, interesting. This is another uh, example of angiography. 
in uh, uh, cardiography, this is the coronary artery angioplasty with stent placement. You know that now these days, uh, you see 90% blockage. Here we have a 90% blockage of the left anterior descending coronary artery. Uh, and this causes infarct. In the past, uh, when you had this situation, you had to implant uh, a bypass. So you have to create a new vessel here. But these days, what you do, you introduce a stent, uh, which is like a small neck. Uh, that here you have, you have, this is a 30 millimeter long uh, drangelutin stem guided to a place along the wire into the artery. So now you have to move this one into the artery. And once it is in the artery, you have to enlarge it. So you see how it's nice. It is possible to do that only thanks to fluoroscopy, because you really see it live where you are moving the stent. Then the sense is expanded to suicide with the balloon inside the catheter. You see it very nicely here. So you boom, you kind of exp And now you look. If you see now the left ascending artery, it is essentially back to normal. Uh, this is just being really, I mean, I think it's an uh, uh, under, is not enough emphasized how enormous was the impact of fluoroscopy. You see the blood flow is increased through the artery, essentially it's back to normal. So it's, it's amazing because what in the past could only be solved with uh, invasive surgery now can be solved in a few minutes. So now having an infarct, if you can have a immediately imaging and then you can place a stent, you solve the problems in a matter of hours and you have no damage for something that in the past was either lethal or could only be resolved with the very invasive uh, uh, surgery. So, uh, so far we have seen the, the two, 2D X-ray imaging. In the next uh, lecture, we will uh, uh, move to, in the next part of this lecture, we will move to the, to the computer tomography, so the, the, to the 3D imaging.